Hello again, everyone. My name is Sean Sublett here at Climate Central in Princeton, New Jersey, and we want to welcome everybody to our continuing webinar series. Today we're going to be focusing on extreme precipitation trends. There's, of course, always been a heavy rain in the weather, but we're seeing the trends in heavy precipitation events going up, and we're going to be teasing out the signal from the noise in the background um, in the background of heavy precipitation events. Uh, we want to remind you, if you've got friends who couldn't join us right away or if you have to duck out early, uh, we are recording the webinar and we'll be posting it online on our website probably within a day or two after we finish the web, uh, webinar this afternoon. I'm Sean Sublett there on the bottom part of your screen. I work with Bernadette woods Plaky, the Director and Chief Meteorologist of our Climate Matters program here at Climate Central. For those of you not familiar with exactly what, our, what we do here in Princeton, our job is to communicate the science and impact of climate change to the general public. We help you bridge that gap between weather and climate to your viewers and to your audience. Again, if you're coming in late, or have to duck out early, you can go back to our workshops and webinars site uh, and pull the webinar up in its entirety. And we have all of our previous ones archived as well. We've had been doing this for a little more than two years now. Some great things out there about heat, about sea level rise, about climate models, all of those things very easy to access at our workshops and webinar sites. Also wanted to let you know if you have questions during the event, there's a little Q&A on the top right part of the, uh, of the WebEx application. Enter your questions there, and we'll get to them either in the midst of the program or at the end. So now I want to welcome our guest. is Dr. Kenneth Kunkel from the Cooperative Institute of Climate and Satellites at NC State University in conjunction with NOAA and the National Centers of Environmental Information. His research focuses on historical climate variability, the specific analysis of regional and global climate models, and extreme events since the late 19th century. And Dr. Kunkel is also a lead scientist with the NCA back from uh, 2014. Uh, so, Ken, are you with us? Yes, I am. Wonderful. All right, I'm going to be passing control over to the presentation to you, and I will let you take it from there, sir. Okay. And off it goes to you. Okay, it looks like you should be seeing my screen here. I've got it. You sound great. Okay, so I will jump right in here. So what I'll do today is uh, first uh, talk about types of floods. Uh, nothing profound in that discussion, but uh, I think I'd like just like to set the, the framework for the rest of the discussion. Then I'll get into uh, my own personal research, which uh, will start with uh, U.S. trends of extreme precipitation, talk a little bit about global trends, and then also uh, at the end talk about the future. So. Um, what kind of floods are there? Well, we could categorize them in any no number of different ways. I, what I've done here is kind of teased out four different types here, flash floods, urban floods, river floods, and coastal floods. Uh, flash floods, uh, I think we all are aware of this, usually occur in uh, or often occur in small, steep watersheds um, caused by short-duration, high-intensity rainfall. A typical flash flood, the flood waters rise and fall rapidly. Uh, here's an example in my own experience. This is in a former neighborhood that I was living in, and the neighborhood was uh, right next to some mountains, and uh, it was a small watershed. You see this little uh, creek running here, uh, which uh, is a continuously running creek, and usually at that level. But we had uh, in July of 2013, about four inches of rain in three hours, uh, massive runoff from here, water levels rose to the top of uh, this road, and you can see here uh, there's a wall, and basically the floodwaters uh, washed away the rest of this wall here. Urban floods are also usually caused by short duration, high intensity rainfall. In the case of urban areas, the reason for the rapid runoff is a high percentage of surfaces that are impervious to water, and thus the runoff is basically immediate. Uh, an example of uh, an urban flood, a major urban flood that I did some research on, occurred back in 1996. 
in uh, Chicago. Uh, in that event, there uh, was up to 16 inches plus of rain in less than 24 hours. In fact, that event uh, set the uh, all-time 24-hour uh, state record rainfall for Illinois. Uh, it caused massive flooding, particularly in the suburbs of Chicago, uh, over $600 million in damages from that flood event. Uh, river floods are a little bit different beast. Um, in most cases, they're caused by multiple precipitation events of moderate to heavy severity that occur over days to weeks and even months in some cases. Uh, snow cover and frozen ground will exacerbate these floods and they can last for days to weeks or again, even into months. A prominent example of this is one that I also did some research on. And this was the uh, 1993 Upper Mississippi River flood that occurred during the summer of that year. Uh, up to or greater than 34 inches of precipitation occurred in some locations and that would compare with, say, average amounts of around 12 inches. Um, record levels uh, occurred on the Upper Mississippi River at some places. It uh, resulted in 15 to $20 billion in damages. 100,000 homes were destroyed. Uh, at that time, uh, it was the second most costly event, uh, major weather event in recent memory uh, after Hurricane Andrew. Uh, since that time, both Katrina and Sandy have uh, exceeded those damage values. Uh, coastal floods are a little bit of a different beast in that they're not directly, usually caused by rainfall, although rainfall can exacerbate them in some cases. But this is from storm surges from tropical cyclones or coastal extratropical cyclones. Um, I guess the iconic example now would be Hurricane Sandy or, or post tropical or post Hurricane Sandy occurred in October of 2012. Um, uh, came on shore, a very populous area in New Jersey and uh, New York City. Uh, storm surge exceeded 14 feet and it caused about $68 billion in damages. Uh, here's a picture of damage from Sandy. And here's another uh, picture, uh, devastating event. Okay, let me draw, jump into the next topic, which is um, uh, what have we all observed uh, in terms of trends in extreme precipitation? Now, I'll talk a little bit about uh, defining what we mean by extreme precipitation uh, and then show some of my recent research results. Uh, the real question to, that I'm addressing here is what are the long-term variations and changes in extreme event occurrence? And my aim in my own research is to analyze as long a period as possible uh, in order to capture uh, both potential anthropogenic changes, but also natural variability that, that provides the uh, background for any uh, anthropogenic changes. Um, Many past studies have used data from about 1950 onward to, to study this. And the reason for that is, is that the observational network is relatively dense from about the mid 20th century onward in the US. Um, myself and, my, and, and some colleagues of mine have focused on analyses extending from the late 19th, early 20th century onward. Um, the the uh, trade off there is that fewer stations are available and thus there's greater un, uh, uncertainty about uh, what's been going on. Uh, the um, core source of data for my research is the uh, US Cooperative Observer Network that's run by the National Weather Service. Uh, that was established in the late 19th century. And so that forms a, a natural place to start analyses since um, uh, basically the uh, technology for measuring rainfall has not changed. Uh, the, the co-op network still uses the eight inch rain gauge. I'm gonna first show some sample analysis for a shorter period of time, and that is from this typical mid-century onward. And I'm gonna show a graph in just a second here that um, shows trends in the number of three inch precipitation days. Uh, and it illustrates some of the uh, characteristics when we look at extreme rainfall and some of the challenges. And here is a graphic, a little busy, but let me just take a second to explain it. Um, this is showing the trend at each station uh, that we have 
uh, fairly complete data from 1950 onward. Uh, so each dot is a station. Uh, the trend, and it shows the trend. The trend is uh, expressed in uh, uh, percent over this period, percent change. If you look at the uh, legend in the, in the bottom here, uh, it runs from minus 100% to plus 100%. Uh, red is an upward trend, blues are downward trends. So if you kind of just stare at this and maybe you need to kind of unfocus your eyes in the eastern part of the U.S., you see a lot of reds, a lot of upward trends. Um, but you also see the, the interspersed values that are blue or downward. And this illustrates one of the challenges in looking at extreme events is that there's sort of natural uh, sampling noise, if you want to call it that, uh, when you do this kind of analysis. You can have adjacent stations, one showing an upward trend, one showing a downward trend. To really see the picture and how climate perhaps is changing, one has to aggregate over a larger area to kind of smooth out these natural variations in, in precipitation. And it comes down to simply, uh, let's just take uh, any given station, perhaps a storm moved through, caused say three and a half inches of rain at one location, and next door it caused two and a half inches. Well, the one station had a three inch rain and the adjacent one did not. And just by chance, you can get even a trend over time in that that's probably not real. Probably it's because of just the natural variations and spatial variability of rainfall. You also see here in the West, you see very few dots out here. Uh, is that because there's no stations here? Well, there are fewer stations, but there's another reason for this. So this sort of summarizes this. If you look in the eastern part of the U.S., you see many upward trends, and a lot of them are quite large. But interspersed with that, you, you see downward trends. And in order to understand what's happening in the climate system as a whole, you have to aggregate spatially. So what about this Intermountain West issue? Well, the reason that you see few stations here is that there's too few, or in some cases, cases in some stations, just no three-inch events. So we can't even calculate a trend there. So that's a problem with taking what, what seems like a reasonable definition of an extreme event, in this case, three inches, might seem reasonable to some. Uh, but in some cases, this is just not um, uh, practical. And in some cases, it may not uh, be that extreme. Let's take a place like New Orleans, they might get two or three or four of these in an average year. Uh, it's not exactly drizzle there, but, but it's not necessarily that extreme. And so we have these differences in climatology that make a definition like this problematic. Okay, so now what we've done in, in our own research, myself and my colleagues, is that we've defined an extreme event as uh, 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 an event or a precipitation amount that exceeds a threshold defined according to a specific average recurrence interval and a duration. So for instance, we might be talking, which I'll talk actually about this in some results, a daily precipitation amount that exceeds an average recurrence interval of one in five years. Now the, the advantage of this kind of definition is that every that the threshold is defined by the climatology of the station itself. And so every station has some threshold that defines this daily one in five year event. So every station uh, has events, they're different amounts, but they are events according to that station's climatology. Um, so in the next couple of graphs, well, I'll show a couple of graphs, and I'm going to show some research findings from the recent third national climate assessment. Uh, these are actually uh, results through 2012, not 2013. And what you'll see here is that when we aggregate over the U.S., we see a strong upward trend in the number of events, but there are important regional variations. So first of all, what's our network? Well, as I said, in my research, I like to go back to roughly the beginning of the 20th century. But I want to use a network that doesn't change much over time. 
And so what I've done is to establish a network or find stations that roughly are covering this entire period of time. That is, they've been monitoring over a century uh, of, of observations. And specifically, we're looking for stations or identifying stations that have less than 10% missing data for this period of 1895 to 2011. That's what we used in the third national climate assessment. And you see the distribution of stations. Uh, first of all, you should notice it's obvious that we have more stations in the east than the west. Typically in the west, it's hard to find stations that start all the way back to uh, the beginning of the 20th century and maintain that network. So it's less dense out here, uh, much more dense in the eastern part of the country. Now, when we aggregate, when I aggregate spatially, I do take this into account. I don't overweight, let's say, Iowa, which has a very dense network, compared to Nevada. Uh, these are weighted equally, even though there's more stations in Iowa than Nevada. Okay, so here's a graph that uh, appeared in the third national climate assessment. And this is an aggregate, and it is for it actually is for two-day precipitation amounts that exceed a five-year recurrence interval, or we might call them five-year storms here. So this is the number of events that occurred aggregated over the whole U.S. And the dominant feature here is this upward trend in the last uh, three or four decades. We've kind of stair-stepped our way up to the point where in this last decade, the, the first decade of the 2000s, we were almost 40% uh, above the long-term average. Now, there's very uh, prominent spatial variations in this. There's another map or a graphic from the, the third national climate assessment, and these are by regions. Now, and if you look at these individual graphics, first look in the east, you see very strong upward trends in the northeast also true in the Midwest and the Southeast. As you move westward, what we find is that the trends either they become less in this case of the Plain State are essentially non-existent. There's really no trend going out and going on in the Western U.S. And if we go beyond that, both Hawaii and Alaska, well, Hawaii in particular, excuse me, my having problems controlling my screen here. Um, Hawaii has actually seen a downward trend. Okay, so let me update these results through 2016. Again, it's, we're talking about two-day uh, accumulations, two-day precipitation amounts that exceed a five-year recurrence interval. Here's a national uh, view of it. We've added another bar here uh, for the 2011 to 2016. The rest of these are 10-year periods. And I'm showing a little bit of a different view. You can see this upward trend again in the last uh, few decades. I've added a number here. So the, the, the um, y-axis here is showing the frequency of events averaged over the U.S. And it's the number of events per station per five years. And since we're talking about five-year events, the average of this should be one. So one is essentially the average by definition. I've also shown another um, way to view this, and that is the average number of years between events over this network. Now, by definition, that should the average would be every five years. So what 5.1 means is in that this first um, decade of the 20th century, uh, instead of once every five years, we were seeing events once every 5.1 years or just a little bit below average. In the, in the 1930s, in the Dust Bowl era, we were seeing events about once every six years, once rather than once every five years. Now, if we go up to the present time, what we've been seeing in the 2000s is, is that rather than seeing these events occur on average at, at an average station once every five years, it's actually been occurring at uh, a frequency of once er every less than four years, 3.9 and 3.8. Now I'm going to show the same graphic, but now for the Northeast, where we've seen uh, the, the uh, largest upward trends. And um, you see more variability, first of all, which is natural. As we go down smaller 
in smaller scales, the, the variability uh, goes up just because of natural sampling of rare events. And here, if you look at the 2000s, instead of once every five years, we've been seeing these occur at the average station once every three years, uh, much more frequently than we would expect from the definition of the event. Okay, <clears throat> so that's one uh, duration, two days, one recurrence interval, five years. How, does, how do the results depend on duration and recurrence interval? So we've done an analysis uh, for um, a number of different combinations, and they're, they're shown here. One, two, three, five, 10, 20, and 30 days. Recurrence intervals of one, two, five, 10, and 20 years. And the next graph is gonna show a national view of the results. And what it is, it's a table or a matrix of values um, that are shown here in the trend in terms of percent per decade, and uh, the color indicates whether it's an upward or downward trend. And here is the, um, the legend here. Uh, the teal colors are indicating upward trends, the brown colors downward trends. If the uh, number here is red, then that means the trend is statistically significant. Well, the first um, message here is that everything is the teal color. That is, all combinations are showing upward trends. Uh, the second thing to notice here is that the numbers are larger as we go to larger return periods are more rare events. So the, the, the largest uh, trends we're seeing are for the, the rarest events. In this case, we went out to, in this analysis, out to 20 years. And finally, if you look closely, and I'm not sure you can see that very well on your screen, but all the numbers are red. So all on a national basis, all of the trends for these 35 combinations are all statistically significant. Now I'm going to, the next graph is going to show this on a regional basis for our regions. Um, and um, if you kind of step back and look at this, so we've got uh, the National Center for Environmental Information regions here, we've got nine regions plus the national. And if you look, you see mostly teal. So most of the trends throughout the U.S. at the regional level are also upward. But you don't see completely teal colors. You see some browns. And where are those browns? They're all located out here in the West. And so we're seeing, again, in this view, important regional variations in what we've observed over time. Uh, largest trends in the uh, Northeast, just as we saw in that bar graph before, uh, most of these are statistically significant, um, and that's true of the Midwest also. Uh, generally, as we go down to the regional level, there's usually some of these combinations that are not statistically significant. And if you go out west, in particular here, there's only one of these combinations that is statistically significant in the uh, far west region, and that's actually a downward trend here for three-day uh, duration, 20-year recurrence interval events. So once again, the picture, uh, upward trends are, are general through the U.S., but there are certain regions where we're not necessarily seeing that. Okay, now um, a focus of my research uh, recently has been on causes of this, and we, uh, we did a project where we looked at the meteorology that was associated with extreme events. And we wanted to answer the question, have there been secular changes in the frequency, intensity, and other characteristics of the meteorology that's producing the heavy precipitation? And this sort of shows our paradigm or our framework for doing this. We uh, broke the meteorology down into these um, seven uh, different categories. Uh, two of them are essentially extropical cyclones but we've broken this up into events that occur near the surface or upper low center, and those that are away from the center, but along either the cold front or the warm front. Uh, the second cat, or the really the third category is tropical cyclones, and we've got mesoscale convective systems, uh, air mass convection, North, North American monsoon, and upslope. Uh, this was a very time-consuming project. We looked at 18,000 events, 
uh, we, we looked at the period from 1908 to 2009 and uh, then aggregated across the U.S. And this was, this is kind of an aggregated view of the meteorology behind this particular event. And these were uh, daily precipitation amounts that exceeded a five-year recurrence interval. That was our, uh, the set of events that we used for this particular project. What did we find? Well, about half the events throughout the U.S. and through all seasons were associated with fronts. Another quarter were not near the fronts, but were near the uh, either the surface or upper low center of the next tropical cyclone. So if you look at these uh, two categories together, um, they represent about 75% of the events. So about 75% of the events uh, in this historical period were, were associated or caused by extropical cyclones. Uh, another roughly 13% caused by tropical cyclones. Uh, mesoscale convective systems were responsible for about 4%. A small percentage nationally caused by the North American monsoon. If we look at the Arizona, New Mexico area, this, this value in that region is much higher. And air mass convection, just a few, which surprised me a little bit, and upslope, forced upslope, uh, that was uh, not associated with the next tropical cyclone, a uh, very small number of events caused by that. So what's, what was the trend in, in, in the number of such events caused by each of these factors? Well, we found that there was a really strong upward trend in events associated with fronts. There was also a st statistically significant trend in events associated with tropical cyclones. Uh, no trend in, in events that were um, associated with the, the, the low center of an extropical cyclone, and no statistically significant uh, trends in the other four categories that we looked at. And so um, we can conclude that particular project by saying that the upward trend was associated uh, principally with the increase in events associated with fronts and tropical cyclones. Now that's interesting, the tropical cyclone part of this is interesting in that we don't really see a trend in the number of landfalling tropical cyclone. What we actually found is that we were getting in the latter part of the period more extreme precipitation events per tropical cyclone. Uh, we've not investigated yet, but we're in the process of doing that, whether the um, uh, trend associated with fronts, whether we're seeing more fronts or fronts with different characteristics, or we're simply getting, again, more events per frontal uh, event or frontal occurrence. Okay, the second part of our project was to look at, are there recent increases, are the recent increases primarily a result of increases in atmospheric water vapor concentrations? We've uh, just completed an analysis of this. We looked at the northeast quadrant of the U.S., which is sort of the focus area where we've seen the largest upward trends. Uh, we looked at just the last roughly 40 years, and we have pretty good radiosonde uh, data. And what we did in this particular part of our ongoing research is that we took each extreme event, and we're looking at daily events that exceed a five-year recurrence interval, and characterized the water vapor environment associated with each of those events by calculating precipitable water from the nearest radiosonde stations for that event. And then we broke that uh, roughly 40-year period into two approximately 20-year periods, a late, later period, 1992 to 2013, and we compared it with uh, the earlier 20-year period of 1971 to 1991. And then we looked at the difference by month. How did, how did that uh, change between these two periods? And these are the results. Um, it's not a constant through the year. Uh, we actually see has, uh, the, the events have been actually characterized by decreased water vapor in the cold season months and in the warm and getting warmer months mainly increases. But that's really um, uh, not telling the full story because in this region, most of these events are actually warm season events. In fact, 86% of these events occur between June and October. And so really to get the picture, we should be looking primarily at this period. 
And what we see here is that if we average over this, uh, there's a increased water vapor associated with this. Each month shows an increase except uh, September, which is a slight decrease. I'm sorry, um, my slides seem to change without me seeming to do anything here. Uh, and so our conclusion with this little preliminary experiment that increases in water vapor concentration are probably an important contributor to the upward trend that we're seeing in the U.S. Okay, now let me move to global. Uh, we've done a little less analysis, well, a lot less analysis on a global scale, but we've done some. I'm going to show some results for five-day duration events uh, exceeding a 10-year recurrence interval. So we're now talking about more extreme events. We had uh, roughly uh, 8,300 stations that uh, we had data for. In this case, we restricted the analysis to uh, 1961 to present. I'll uh, also show just briefly some results for these other types of definitions, one-day, 10-year event, uh, one day, one year event, and then precipitation that occurs above the 99th percentile of daily precipitation amounts. So this was the network we had to deal with. And you can immediately see that lots of stations in the U.S. and the density of stations in the rest of the land areas is much less. And in fact, in certain areas like Africa and South America, we really had uh, no stations or not enough stations to say anything about these areas. But we did have enough stations in Australia we could do an analysis. Uh, so uh, what we did is we uh, broke the globe into, into grid boxes. We did the analysis by grid box, did a trend analysis at each grid box. And this graphic shows these grid box trends. Uh, the uh, blue colors are upward trends, red downward trends. I apologize for the color schemes changing compared to that first graphic I showed, but um, you know, each, I'm just pulling these from our research papers and we did make different decisions there. So first of all, if you look at North America and Eurasia, uh, most of the grid boxes are blue. That is, we're seeing an upward trend. Uh, some areas that we're seeing downward trends are here in Southeast Asia. Uh, dominantly, and then kind of around the Mediterranean. Um, Australia is kind of a mixed bag with decreasing trends along the coast and increasing trends in the interior. Now, uh, we don't have data for much of the southern hemisphere, and the equatorial regions are kind of only sparsely covered. Uh, we did aggregate these for northern, uh, mid, and upper latitudes over land areas. So roughly, uh, 30 north uh, upward, we averaged that region for these different metrics and generated time series. And that's what this graphic shows. And what you see here, um, kind of uh, maybe a little bit of a downward trend from the 60s into the, into the 70s. But since about 1980, we've seen uh, really large uh, increases in each of these th uh, four metrics. So globally, uh, we're also seeing a uh, sizable upward trend in extreme precipitation. Okay, there are challenges. I just have a few more minutes and um, I'm going to try to roll through this. Uh, some of the challenges, we have a finite network of observing stations. There are inherent uncertainties in sampling rare events. And there's the realities of any observing network. You have missing data, you have stations closing, and other issues. And, but our, we conducted a sensitivity experiment to evaluate certain sources of uncertainty, specifically those related to a finite network and missing data. And we, what we basically did was use the modern network that's very dense as a reference, and then we subsampled from that modern dense network to produce a density of stations that's like the long-term network that I showed earlier. We randomly shuffled years to pr for produce artificial time series of extreme events. And then we repeated this many times uh, so that we could look at a distribution of trends and get an idea of what the sampling uncertainty is. And this shows a result from a paper we published uh, back a few years ago in the Journal of Hydrometeorology. And what I want to point out here is these, uh, these are uh, kind of average 
a, a, a occurrence of various extreme events. This is one day duration, one year return interval. Uh, and this shows the average value for roughly 20 year periods. And this is the uncertainty from this uh, experiment that we did. And what I want to show is that in this last period, that if you look at the, the value, the average value and the uncertainty, that the uncertainty bounds are above the uncertainty bounds of any other uh, a period here. That is, this recent upward trend uh, or upward or high values appears to be uh, robust with respect to some of the problems and challenges in any observing network. Okay, let me talk briefly now about the future. Uh, we've been doing some work more recently on uh, analyzing the uh, global climate models, specifically the CMIP-5 suite of simulations, and what do they say about future trends and extremes, and what kind of reliability do we have in this? Well, one of the things we know is that water vapor uh, saturation water vapor is a very sensitive uh, or it's sensitively dependent on temperature and it increases by 7% per degree C. So I want to show you what the models do with water vapor. Uh, how, what do they simulate? In particular, I'm going to show uh, the results for a 30-year maximum uh, precipitable water calculated between 850 and 500 millibars. I'll also show daily maximum precipitation. And these will be between the, uh, the difference between the late 21st century and the late 20th century. So roughly the trend over 100 years. And this is the result from uh, averaged over, uh, I think, about 15 climate models. Uh, the colors here, if you look at the scale, go from zero up to a greater than 50% increase. The uh, greens and blues are generally above 20%. And in fact, if you look globally, what you find that uh, models do is increase water vapor by at least 20% everywhere on the globe. And this is just a direct consequence of this strong dependence of saturation vapor pressure on temperature. Over the continental US, the increases are in the 25 to 40% range. If you look at what the models produce in precipitation, models aren't necessarily that reliable for precipitation. So this is a useful thing to kind of look at, but um, um, not necessarily uh, perhaps used quantitatively. But when you look at the maximum precipitation, when I say 30-year maximum, what we're doing at each grid point is looking at the max single largest day in a 30-year period uh, between this 30-year period and the late um, 20th century period. And then we're averaging over the, the roughly 14, 15 models that we have for this. Interesting thing here is that almost everywhere, but not everywhere, you see increases in this quantity and actually over the US, large increases of mostly 20 to 30% in this particular metric. So our confidence in water vapor increasing is high if global warming continues because of this very direct link between temperature and saturation vapor pressure. So what are the implications? I'm just gonna take another two minutes to talk about that. What should be done about planning for the future, specifically in design and planning of runoff control structures that typically have very long lifetimes of 50 years or more? Uh, the extreme rainfall design values that are used in building these and designing these, things like the 100-year storm, are based solely on historical observations, which is essentially a stationary climate assumption. And the question that, that I think I'm asking, is that the least risky path forward? What it implies essentially is that our forecast for the future, if we continue to use those values, is that this upward trend will reverse itself and it'll come back down to this long-term average level. So concluding thoughts, uh, um, there's a relatively direct link between short duration extreme precipitation and flash and urban flooding. River flooding is a different matter. Additional variables are important because the temporal scales, spatial scales, and the runoff capacity are larger. Also, antecedent soil moisture is important. To address this question, one really needs to bring in 
hydrologic modeling in addition to what we understand about the atmosphere. And uh, some, some comments on meteorology. Um, I am a meteorologist, just in case you were wondering. Um, changes in extreme precipitation will arise from a number of factors. The two most important, I think, are atmospheric water vapor concentration, which essentially determines the capacity of the atmosphere to produce extreme precipitation, and then weather systems that are necessary to, to produce rainfall, and that's sort of the opportunity. I hypothesize that as event duration increases, that is, if we look, if we're interested in really long events like monthly seasonal or beyond, the impact of synoptic meteorology becomes increasingly important on future changes. Uh, water vapor increases are more certain than changes in synoptic meteorology, um, although the water vapor increases are so large that the models seem to indicate that's the dominant factor. Uh, so, short duration urban flooding, I think, arising from intense local rainfall is likely to increase, but ri river flooding depends on weather system changes as well as these other factors that influence that. And then I think that in the case of river flooding, there's less confidence about how that might change in the future. Well, so for those of you who are online, I thank you for your attention. Ken, thank you very much for that presentation. Really informative as how we get that, that heavy rain signal out of the, the background noise, especially there uh, in the Northeast. I was also kind of interested in how, how much of it was frontal and uh, extra tropical. Uh, we're going back briefly, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna let you have control of the presentation here through the questions in case you wanna reference some slides. Um, when you were teasing out the difference between tropical cyclones, extra tropical lows, how, and this is kind of not an overly important question, but more of a curiosity. Uh, for something like a post-tropical, you know, the quote unquote remnant tropical cyclone, uh, how did you categorize something like that? For example, if you think about a 1969 situation uh, with Camille in Virginia, uh, and I know we had a couple, like, a couple more in Houston, that, those kinds of things, how did you classify those? Yeah, what we did is, um, and, and you know, these are decisions one has to make when one does mm -hmm. research. We decided that we would categorize these as tropical cyclones. That, let's take Camille as an example, that those extreme rainfall events that, occur, that were occurred in the, um, particularly the spine of the Appalachians, would simply not have had occurred if you didn't have that tropical cyclone. So, even though in these cases a tropical cyclone may have become extra tropical, we still considered the cause to be the remnants of the tropical cyclone. So it would have fallen in our tropical cyclone bin. Uh, another question I had about looking at the, the daily rainfall totals, this three inch plus daily rainfall totals, were those calendar days or were you trying to make some kind of um, you're trying to also count for, for events that cross the calendar day. Yeah, that's a that's a real good question. And and uh, in this case it was just it was just since we're using the cooperative observer network, they only observe at a daily time resolution. So we're we're stuck with that. So it's simply an amount they recorded between whatever their observing time is, a lot of them are now 7 a.m. It would be 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. So you do have the problem that an event that's ongoing would be split into two days, and therefore you would actually miss it in, in your analysis. So that's a kind of a, just a problem that's, that's implicit with uh, the nature of the Cooperative Observer Network. What we did in the National Climate Assessment, one reason we did two-day, five-year, analysis was to address this very issue, that if you had an event that crossed over the observing time, you would capture it in a, in a two-day accumulation. And, and that's the very reason we did, did that particular uh, duration for the National Climate Assessment. All right, good to know. Bern is here. Bern, did you have some questions as well for, uh, for Ken? Well, Ken, thank you so much. We really, truly appreciate this. You know, when Sean and I were coming up with the webinar schedule for the year, and it's one of those topics of heavy precip that is such a hallmark of climate change. And we've tried ourselves to get this information out, 
and often we come back to some of your research. And so we really wanted to get you in front of this group to, so that you had the opportunity to show them all the stuff you've been working on. One side note for our meteorologists who are on this call, oh, not all, but some of the graphics that Ken had showed, and especially with reference to the NCA report, we were able to produce those in TV-ready format, so we do have some of those resources on our media archive, which is climatecentral.org slash climate-matters. So if you're looking for some stuff, that's one thing, but two, Ken, I wanted to ask you about some of your global analysis. This is really intriguing to me. As you know, you already covered a lot of the caveats with working not only in our own data sets, but global data sets. I was curious what data set that was that you found. Was that GHCN connected or was it something separate? Yeah, it's a, it's a GHCN daily is the okay. data set there. And, um, and one of the things, if you look at Let's take a map like this. Um, you know, you see some areas that that um, um, you think, well, they ought to have some data for some of these places, right? At least that's what thing. Let's take India. Here's a good example. <laughs> no stations. This is a data sharing issue. There are there's a lot of good data in India. Uh, I, Brazil has good data. A lot of the South American countries have pretty long data records that are very good. But um, there's not um, uh, the open sharing of data is an issue with this kind of analysis. So those uh, countries are not represented in, in GHCM daily. At least the data are not complete enough that one can do this kind of analysis. That is fascinating. I'm excited to find that report and read more on that. Um, one more question that I personally had, with all of the really cool analyses you're doing on precip, what is it that you are looking at next? What current reports are you working on or something that you want to take on? Well, um, this is very mundane work, uh, but <laughs> I, uh, not, I not, 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 not all of this, but, but the, uh, <laughs> the issues with uh, um, station sampling and 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 um, what would you expect? I mean, if let's just say that that let me address a, a kind of a question. If you were interested in your own county, let's just say that was your interest area. Given a background trend, let's say we knew that there was a, a large scale trend going on at the county scale. How long would you have to wait before you could definitively identify a statistically significant uh, trend at the local level? So it's a matter of defining, and I think it, the, the, the question that comes in, um, let's say you have two counties next to, next to each other. One is seeing a large upward trend and the other is not. And you could see from that first map that there likely are areas like that. Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily that the background climate is changing differently in those two counties, but just that the sampling of heavy events is by, by random chance, given those two counties different records. Should that one county be changing their design criteria and the other not? And the answer in my mind is no. There's, there's a more general regional pattern going on. But the question is, um, what are the limitations of our sampling network to determine what the historical trend has been. So that's one area I want to uh, work on uh, next. Um, let me give you a, a more exciting <laughs> idea. And, <laughs> and that is, we know just from this analysis, fronts are really important. Um, we don't really have a climatology of fronts. And we're working on algorithms to automatically identify fronts. We want to do some climatological analysis of fronts. Have there been regional variations and seasonal variations in the occurrence of fronts? Uh, have they changed in, in terms of their characteristics? Have they changed over time? And can that we relate that to the uh, uh, more specifically to the uh, heavy rain trends that we see? Oh, that is exciting. Okay. Hey, we did get uh, one question from our friend Rob Perello in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana. 
Uh, Kenzie wants to know if you've run any additional statistical analyses on greater observed extreme events that have 25, 50, or 100 year return periods. Um, we've done a little bit of analysis. It, it, all, it becomes always very difficult um, when you go way out uh, in, in the tail of the distribution to do robust statistical analysis. Uh, we have done it on a larger scale, like US-wide, to see whether, uh, if we look at our network, has the most extreme rainfall events, uh, the occurrence of that changed over time. Uh, and that would be, because we're looking at a 100-year record, that would be you know, kind of like a 100-year storm kind of thing. And we do find that. I didn't put it in here in this, this presentation, that, that if you look at the U.S. as a whole, more of those, the most extreme event, have been occurring in the last 20 years than was occurring earlier in the century. So we also see that trend uh, in the most extreme events. It's just that when you look at those really extreme events, you can't go down too much in, in regional scale because you just don't have any uh, enough stations to look at that. All right. Hope that answers the question, sort of. Sure. I have another one also, Ken. You're very intimately involved in the National Climate Assessment, and I know we're in the process nationally of gearing up for the next one. Do you think you could bring us up to speed on when that will be released and maybe a couple of the things in the build-up to it so that this group could understand that process? Yeah, um, the uh, fourth National Climate Assessment um, author teams have been formed. They're now in the process of writing um, a first draft of the report. Um, it'll go through some internal review over the summer. Um, right now, the target um, is that the uh, the draft will be released for public comment in the September time frame. Um, that could slip. That's It's kind of actually an ambitious target for us. Um, and then um, it's also going to a review, we'll go to a review by the National Academy of Sciences. I think the target release date right now is sort of kind of summer of 2018 or fall of 2018, something in that in that time frame. All right, one more question from Rob there again in Louisiana. He wanted to go back to the, a specific event. Uh, he said, we had a major flood in southern Louisiana last year, and there were some attribution articles uh, that stated that the frequency was going to be up. He says he wants to know, uh, I'm most interested in the frequency of these events. Can you comment on these? Yeah, yeah that was quite an event. <laughs> Louisiana event last year. Uh, yeah, because that, that's something that right. we've been that's something we've been doing some work on here, and and that's one of the things that, that we came to to conclusion with as well. Yeah, I think then some stations get a like thirty inches or more or something. In that right, area. right. Yeah, very, it's very. Absolutely insane. insane. Rob lived through it mm -hmm. there in literally in his market. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 As far as attribution, um, the um, I'm actually not much of a fan of doing attribution on single study, single events like that. Um, I think, you know, we need to look at it in an aggregate sense. Uh, that being said, uh, as I recall in that event, um, um, the Gulf, and, and, and you might correct me if I'm wrong, but the Gulf of Mexico is quite warm, warmer than, than average. So the amount of water vapor coming into that system was likely above average for the given conditions. And that warming of the Gulf is likely, um, part of it is likely to be uh, uh, anthropogenically forced. And so, you know, one can think, say in just general terms, there indeed probably was some factor or some part of the uh, uh, extremity of that event that, that relates to the overall global warming we've seen. All right, thanks very much. Bernie, do you have anything you wanted to follow up with with that? No, I mean, that can just to bring you in, we were one of the team members doing that attribution analysis with NOAA. And it was fascinating okay. for Sean and I to sort of sit through the process since it is really a newer cutting edge science. And yeah. it, it was 
what it seems to be, just to bring you in too, Rob, on what we watched internally here was so much of it comes down to defining the event in space and time and then working around that. And if anyone really is interested in learning more, it's, we have an attribution page. It's www.climatecentral.org for World Weather Attribution. And so if you're interested in learning more there, there's a lot that gets either really geeky, if you want to go that far, or a little bit more removed. And for anyone who's interested in learning more about extreme event attribution, there was a National Academy study done last, I think it was March it came out. It was early in the year last year. And it really did a nice overview of where the science is, where it's heading in. And it was very cautious in that point that the, that some of this is possible just in, in the approach, really the defining of the events, the space, the time, all of that. So and from the scientific side, it's really fascinating science that we've been able to sort of watch firsthand here. Mm -hmm. uh, we've just had one more come in. Uh, it looks like our friend Monica in Sacramento. Uh, she's curious if you think the Western extreme events in California this past water year are starting to reflect what's happening on the East Coast. Yeah, that, that's an interesting. I mean, you bring you bring up another area, actually, of um, my interest in research, and that's really fully understanding this east to west difference that we find in extreme precipitation. We also see it in heat extremes, but just the opposite, where the west has seen lots of heat extremes and the east has not as much. And so, um, understanding that, I think, is key to understanding whether or not. The um, what would happen this past winter um, is that a harbinger of things to come, or is there some underlying um, uh, feature or change in the climate system that will give this tendency for for dry years on the west coast to you know come back and and maybe the um, six, 2016 2017 water year out there is. Uh, uh, you know, really important, but not necessarily a harbinger of things to come. So I can't really answer the question definitively, but um, it's a area of my interest also to understand this east-west difference. Sure, you know, and that's one of the things about the emerging science. So uh, we appreciate your input on that. Uh, we're about to uh, the bottom of the hour, so I want to uh, thank again uh, Ken for for helping us out. Uh, this afternoon and earlier on this morning uh, for those of you in the West Coast. And thank everybody for, for joining us uh, today on our continuing webinar series. We've got a few more planned for, uh, for later on this year, hoping to have something uh, for next month regarding climate change and health. And for those of you still on the call, uh, do look for a big uh, report from us, a lot of graphics coming down the pike tomorrow in your email, uh, email boxes regarding sea level rise. A report came out from NOAA back in January about some of the more extreme scenarios by the end of the century, and we've got some very uh, illustrative graphics uh, to go with that. So, Ken, again, thank you very much, sir. We appreciate it. You're welcome. And everybody uh, have a good rest of the week and a good weekend. Take care, all.